Praise the Lord. Good morning, Believers Fellowship. It's good to see you today. What a beautiful day. Is this on? All the good stuff's ready to go, right? <laughs> what a day. We've been in this series of messages called Battle Ready, Suit Up, all right? We're part three of being of suiting up. So if you've missed the earlier two, you can find them on our webpage, on YouTube, or who knows where else, Facebook, and somewhere out there crossing the galaxies on the sound waves. So somebody will hear it, amen? But it's a powerfully important message, uh, not only for our lives because of the culture we're living in, but the day and time we're living in, because even where our church is at. A lot of mourning and sorrow in Florida, and our sympathies and prayers have gone out as well to see the tragedy that's taking place there. You know, as I've studied for this message, and we've talked about this spiritual warfare that's going on, so it's interesting to see how so few people really understand what's really going on in our culture. You know, that there is a war going on, and for the souls and the minds of people. And Satan already has easily won that battle in too many hearts and minds. Maybe not to the extreme of that young man in Florida, but anytime we check out a life and check out on God, we're in trouble in our lives. And there's no end to what uh, the mind can go as far as falling into failure and defeat uh, when it's absent of the presence of God and when Satan's having his rule and reign. We know that he's the author of confusion, and he's the author of chaos, and he's the author of death. And that's always what he's working in our lives or through our lives or to our lives. Amen. So I realize that if we talk about all the different things from mental health to gun control, also somebody needs to bring up, hey, we need to get back to God in our nation. And we need to get back to presenting God in our, in our, in our educational world, our legal world, and every other aspect of our society and culture. That's because that's where the greatest issues are. Amen. We've talked about, and you see a little of the hints of this as we've talked about battling up as Paul's talking to the church about the spiritual war when he says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. These next verses are what I'm talking about. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. And look the way he puts it, against the rulers, against the powers against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. And he's talking about demonic principalities, and demonic rule and demonic influence in the culture and in the world. And we've talked a little bit about that already. He said, therefore, in verse 13, since all that's true, we're in a spiritual battle, take up the full armor of God that you may be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm. Therefore, having girded your loins with truth, And having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We're going to stop right there, but he does go in. He talks about the armor a little bit more. We'll discuss that a little bit more next week. But I wanted us to go back and just reflect on one thing about all that we've learned about putting on the armor of God. Remember, first and foremost, it's about putting on Jesus Christ. When you come to Christ, you're in this battle now with your old flesh and the old man. The Bible says we have to put off the old man daily and put on Christ. Everything in this spiritual armor points to Jesus. The sword of truth, the belt of truth, I mean, and, and the, the sword and the shield and the breastplate, everything, it just, it just speaks of Jesus Christ. And so Paul kind of summarizes to the Romans when he says, you put on the Lord Jesus Christ and don't make provision for the flesh, the, that old man. Don't give him a room to move. Don't give him room to operate. You're a new person in Christ Jesus. And God has not eradicated Joe Arms, but he's given Joe Arms freedom from the old Joe, which always made stupid decisions, bad choices, and didn't understand what was going on around him. There's a new Joe, praise the Lord, in town. And this new Joe Arms has the capacity to know Jesus Christ and to know his will and to walk in fellowship with God. And I'm putting up, so a lot of people think, well, I'm dying to myself. It's like, well, self no longer exists. No, God loves you, all right? And he redeemed you and saved you, so you're still there. But all those things, that old nature needs to be laid aside, and you need to embrace this new nature, which is in Jesus Christ. And he puts it so aptly, and that's putting on Jesus. When it comes to resisting the schemes of the enemy and fighting in a spiritual plane, then we understand a little more clearly now what he's talking about in the context that Jesus provides us the armor, that he is everything about our armor, all right? So we've seen already, as we started this last week, in verse 14 and 15, revealed three pieces of armor that he said you've already placed on it. We dealt with the belt of truth last week. But he writes it this way, having girded, the idea's already been done. 
having put on, it's already been done, having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. These are things that, that we've, we've dealt with in the context of giving our life to Christ. And I'll speak a little bit more about that in a moment. But what he's telling us here is that these are things that you're ready for the battle. In reality, you, just need, you need to take up now and, and, and do what God's called you to do. You need to realize that this armor is part of your life and it's there in your life. So take notice of it. You've, you've, you've girded your loins up with truth and now you, you, you're, you're, you put on the breastplate of right. You put on this gospel shoes, so to say. So as we dealt with truth last week, we talked about how important it was that in the very core of everything going on here, it's got to be about truth. It has to do with internal honesty and wholeness and transparency before the Lord. Standing in the truth of God's word. Being truthful with God. That'd be a first start, amen. Being truthful with ourselves. That's a big step right there. And being truthful with each other. Jesus said, you know, if any man's going to worship God, he must worship him in spirit and in truth, Right? So the truth means that there's this transparency now in my life that has to be embraced. No longer hiding in the shadows, no longer pretending things, right? No longer rationalizing and justifying the things that are in my life that God is speaking to me about, but just coming into the light and enjoying my fellowship with Jesus Christ. As we move forward with this process of uh, after placing on this and girded up with this, uh, with, the, with this belt of truth, we move to the breastplate of righteousness today, all right? In verse 14, he puts it this way, stand firm, having girded your loins with truth and having put on on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, this is not the first time this terminology shows up. In fact, Paul's making reference to a passage in Isaiah when he says this, and he put on righteousness. This is God. He's put on righteousness like a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself with zeal as a mantle. Great passage of scripture giving reference to the Lord and the Lord's passion and the Lord's zeal to move forward, to redeem his people and to save his, to save, to save his nation. So we see that we have a God who's zealously moving on our behalf and has now called us to be part of what he's doing. We're, we're in the kingdom now. We're part of the, the, the children of God. We're part of the army of God. We're part of the people of God. So it says now when it comes to this issue about preparing yourself, you need to have on this breastplate of righteousness. I don't know that we really fully understand that. I think that we, we, we need to seek to grasp that idea of what that really means when you, you think about a, a breastplate. I think it has to do in the context of having put on the fact that there, there comes a time in your life when you've given your heart to Jesus Christ. And now Paul put it this way, when we come into a faith relationship with Jesus in Romans 5, he says that God at that point gives us this gift and he calls it the gift of righteousness. God has given you this beautiful gift of righteousness. And it's something that he has placed on your life. It's so much so his righteousness. It's not about our righteousness. In fact, it has to be that because we can't come to know God in our own righteousness. The Bible says we're not saved by works lest any man should boast. In other words, the, the best thing that will come out of me trying to work myself to heaven is just more pride. Look what I've done. Look what I've accomplished. But it's not about that. It's about the righteousness of God, which is found in Christ Jesus, that is placed in your life when you give your heart and life to Christ. And this is such a crucial part of your life, and it needs to be recognized and needs to be brought in and say, Lord, help me understand that about this righteousness, that it's not mine, it's, it's your righteousness. 1 Corinthians 1 says, And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us, Jesus has become to us wisdom from God. He has become to us righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Why is this so important that we understand this? Because all too often in our Christian life, we measure ourselves by our own standard. And we measure ourselves by other people's standards. I don't hold myself up to, to anybody's standard, ultimately, if I'm going to be biblical, but to Jesus. He's the standard bearer. He's the one which we compare ourselves to. He's the one we want to be like. He's the one we want to follow after. He's the one we want to be transformed into to his likeness. And we, we start losing, the, uh, I think, that understanding when we focus on ourselves and what can I do or what have I done or what have I accomplished or what have I not accomplished. And then obviously Satan likes to use that one especially. Paul put it this way when talking about even his very best in Philippians. He, he said, indeed, I count everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For this sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and I count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Now, this passage, Paul's making it clear, it's not about his efforts and his morality. In fact, if you study this passage of Scripture in Philippians, he goes through this list of all he's done for God. 
All the Judaistic law he's kept. All the favor that he's gained among the religious world. And he lists all his credentials. And he's saying, you know, that's just a bunch of junk. Now, I'm sure to all those who held those credentials, they didn't like that very much. But he's saying, if you're trusting all your good stuff and all your morality and all your good works to make you right with God, you are going to be sorely disappointed because even your righteousness at its very best is like leprous, filthy rags. What you need is the righteousness of God. But what happens when I gave my life to Jesus, God gave me that righteousness. You know what that does? That allows me to fellowship with him, no longer separated by sin, no longer separated by selfishness and selfish ways. I can, I've been made right with God. I can know God. God's a righteous God. God's a holy God. So he deals with everything in me that's unholy by giving me this gift of righteousness. Gets me to the place that I can really walk with him. I can know him. I can hear from him. I can speak to him. We can fellowship together. And it's even so in the context of this spiritual battle. We've talked about Satan. He's the accuser of the brethren. He loves to fire those fiery darts and arrows at us of accusation. You're not good enough. It's not going to work. You're not going to measure up. Boy, you're a complete failure in your life. And on and on, those kind of things can go. And that's when we're reminded about the righteousness of God. Paul put it this way in Romans 8, 33, when he says, Who can bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. What's that saying? I don't have to listen to all the lies anymore. I don't have to let that stuff hinder me from being what God wants me to, 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 to be or go where God wants me to go. I don't have to sit back and say, I'm just not worthy because he made me worthy with his worthiness. You understand that? God gave you what you need to be in fellowship with him and to be in a walk with him. So when those fiery schemes of Satan start manifesting themselves in your thought life, about your inadequacies or your inabilities or your inconsistencies. The only way to protect yourself against those unrighteous accusations is to stand upon the word of God. The only one who justifies me is the Lord Jesus Christ and God himself. And he has called me righteous in his sight. That ought to be cause for rejoicing in your life and excitement. Now this breastplate, you know, in fact, the Greek word for breastplate is the word thorax. If you're familiar with Thorax, it's basically that part of our body. It's the English definition, and the word is thorax in the English, that describes that part of your body that goes from your neck down to your abdomen, all right, where you're the principal organs. If you talk about a thoracic doctor, a thoracic surgeon, they're dealing with the organs of the heart and the lungs and the things that are in this portion of your body. Those areas where the blood is carried to all the other parts of your body and pumped out, those important areas have to be protected. And this breastplate would cover this whole th thoracic area, front and back. And it would be there to protect you. We talk about different historians as we mention things in history like Josephus. There was another Greek historian by the name of Polybius, and he was this historian. He says, you know, as he talked about the armor of the Greek soldier and the Romans, he talked about a breastplate. And he said they would don this breastplate, and he said it was, he called it, it was known as the, the heart protector. The heart protector. I thought that's exactly what it is. Our heart needs to be guarded. The scripture tells us to guard your heart with all diligence because out of it are the very virtues of your life. It's there in your heart where you choose Christ Jesus. We use the terminology often, you know, you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ with all your heart, which basically means who you are, the very core of your being. You're putting your faith in Christ Jesus. That's to believe God with your heart. The Bible tells us to love God with all our heart. Scripture tells we serve God with all our heart. We live for Jesus with all our heart. It's in your heart that becomes the very little room in your life where faith, that faith commitment is made, where you put in your mind and your will and your emotions to the task of saying, I truly trust Jesus. I truly, it's not just in my head. It's not just in my emotions. I'm not just have this feeling I want to be forgiven or I want to go to heaven. It goes beyond just what I know in my brain and what I, I know in my emotions. It goes down to that place in my heart where the will is activated, where I choose that's where the decision is formulated of all these, of all these influences of mind, will, and emotion. It all comes down to here say, hey, I'm making a choice for Christ. That has to be guarded. You don't want to let Satan get any area of your heart in captivity. You have to be cautious, the Bible said, about letting your heart get hard. You know, and, and to not have a soft heart and a, a gentle heart and a sensitive heart so that when God speaks to your heart, you're not justifying your actions and rationalizing your situation. You're just letting God speak to you. 
You're letting God touch you in the deepest part of your life. You're letting God move. And that's where you come and say, hey, my heart's important. My relationship with God is important. It needs to be guarded. And praise God that it's guarded first and foremost. God's righteousness covers my heart. It protects my heart, this place of faith, this place of hearing God, this place that we stand from which all the issues of our life, that's protected. So I can move according to the will of God for our life. This righteousness God imparts, it provides protection in that area of your life. Now, sometimes we talk so much about positionally being righteous. God makes us right. How does he do that? He forgives us of all our sin. Past, present, future. The Bible says, he who knew no sin, he became sin that you and I might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So God sends his son. He takes upon your sin. Now, he knew no sin, remember. The the theological terminology has to do with the impeccability of Christ, that he was without sin. He knew no sin. He's impeccable. That's what the word literally means. No sin whatsoever. The only one who ever fit that bill is Jesus. Amen? Amen. But the Bible says he knew no sin, but he became sin on the cross for you so that you might be made righteous with God. Paul's uh, describing this a little bit further in Romans 5. He says, you know, it's by one man's sin, talking about Adam and Eve, by their sin that sin entered into the world. Their disobedience opened the door. But he went on to say, but it's by one man, and that's talking about Jesus, the God man, by one man's obedience to to the Father, we can be made righteous with God and right with God. So praise God for Jesus that he took upon our sin. And but at the result of it means that all the stuff that I was, I was accountable for and could be accused of and be found blamed for, it's gone. I've been made right with God. That's a glorious truth to realize that I can stand before God without all this condemnation. The Bible says if we're in Christ, there's therefore no more condemnation. Otherwise, I'd be standing there in my condemnation saying, well, Lord, but I'm trying. I wanna, I'll be a preacher if that will help, you know, and I'll go to Sunday school and I'll, I'll go to Lyft on Sunday morning if I have to, you know, whatever it takes. <laughs> really sacrifice to go Sunday night. Or I'll try to be good or I'll memorize a verse or I'll give some money to the poor. And we come up with all these things of self-justification. That's what Paul was saying. It's rubbish. I want to be found in him. Not having the righteousness that comes by doing good and keeping the law, but a righteousness that comes by faith in Christ Jesus. You have to realize just how incredible that is for you and your standing before God. Never, never just kind of say, well, I'm right with God. You need to understand what that cost, amen? Now, part of that now, now let's just say I'm positionally right with God, but there's the point of being practically right with God. God wants us to live in his righteousness. God wants us to deal with the things in our life that aren't right when they aren't right. I thank God that he's forgiven my sin, but what happens if I go out and commit a sin today? Well, the price has already been paid. Wouldn't you agree? The cross covers it all. The blood of Jesus. The Bible says he died not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. All sin's been paid for. That means that I, but it's, I, I've got this righteousness, but it doesn't mean I'm never going to sin again. That's why First John says, you know, if we sin, because we will sin, but I'm righteous with God. Why do I? Because we stepped out of that righteousness because we put on the old man and chose not to do what God said or believe God and did our own thing. And that's where we get in trouble every time. But God wants us living a practically righteous life. We have this great verse which helps us to, to, to stay in that place and enjoy the righteousness of God in our life by getting rid of the things that are wrong in our life. If we confess our sins, God's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from what? So when the unrighteousness comes in because of my disobedience, because of my unbelief, because of my sin, I got to take it to the Father. I can't run from the light. I can't run from God. I can't justify, well, everybody else is doing it. No, I'm not everybody else. I want to live for Jesus. I want to be what God wants me to be. So what do I need to do? I need to agree with God. That's what this word confess means. It's the Greek word, homologos. Logos is that word for, for, for word. And homo is a word which means the same. So homologos means to say the same thing. He's saying, hey, when it comes to your sin and your unrighteousness, your unrighteousness, you need to say the same thing that God says about it. What does God say about it? It's wrong. It needs to be repented of. It needs to be turned over to Jesus and confessed. It's it's more than to to confess my sin means more than just to feel bad about it. Certainly emotions, it's nice. And when you stop feeling bad about it, that probably means that you somehow left off the breastplate of righteousness. Your heart's getting hard, right? So I think there's there's that 
emotional part where we're, we're, we're convicted. We feel bad about what we've done. It's wrong. I shouldn't have spoke that way. I shouldn't have treated my spouse that way. I, I shouldn't have acted that way. I shouldn't have been so full of pride trying to push somebody else out of the way to, so I could have the upper seat kind of thing. I, that has to be dealt with. And so I deal with it by coming to the Father and say, Lord, I've sinned against you here. I did this, and when you said to do this, and I was wrong, and I turn from it. Because if I'm going to say about that issue, what God says about that issue, it means not only to recognize it, it means to repent of it. And so I'm putting it back where it goes back under the blood of Jesus Christ, and I'm not going to move that way. If I don't, be sure that the accuser of the brethren will remind you daily about it. He'll come with every accusation. He'll tell you at some point, it, well, it's, it's not even, you shouldn't even talk about God because you're so worthless now. Or you, you, you know, it's too late. To, it's too late. You know, you should have confessed those sins yesterday or it's not going to work for you. Remember how he works? And those thoughts come in our mind. It's, you're no good. He's going to probably blot your name out of the book of life, which the Bible says he won't do that. But if you're ignorant of scripture, you may believe he might do it. But he'll come up with every kind of lie that you can imagine to keep you from being effective for God and to keep you from confessing your sin, really getting, dealing with it honestly before the Lord. And I want you to know that's one of the battlegrounds that you face when we do fail the Lord in our life and we sin against God in some of our life. He doesn't want to make it easy for you. <laughs> and he'll come with every excuse first. And if he can't stop you there, then he'll tell you it's too late or God really doesn't know you're no good. Or you might as well, what are you wasting your time for? You say, well, Joe, what do I need to confess? You said I was righteous, all right? You are in Christ and you are already forgiven. That might be hard to understand but because if all sin has been paid for, but your righteousness and your standing with God is important because if I don't move to that place where I know he's called me to live my life in his care and under his leadership and under his headship in my life, then I'm out here doing my own thing. I'm not going to know the will of God. I'm not going to know the joy of the Lord. I'm not going to know the peace that comes in Christ. I'm just going to be messed up. Confession, it clears the way for that, that fruitful expression of God living through me the way he desires to live in and expressing his righteousness. So we, we are made positionally right, but we have a responsibility to stay right by taking things to the cross that are not right, keeping things right with God. Paul put it this way in Acts 24. He says, you know, I always do my very best to maintain a blameless conscience before God and before men. That's a powerful verse. I do my very best to maintain a clear conscience before God and before men. I want to have a heart to try it with God. Breastplate fit into place, protection over the heart and over those vital organs of your life. It must be embraced. But another part of this, he says, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel. Josephus describes these feet. I don't know if you can see them that very clear on, that, on, on the overhead there. But basically, it's a pair of sandals with one flipped over that shows the knobby side. Josephus said, you know, that, that, that the soldiers uh, under the Roman tutelage, would they, they wore shoes that were thickly studded with sharp nails so as to ensure good grip when they're fighting. Historians tell us that the military success of both Alexander the Great as well as Julius Caesar was due in large measure to their armors having the best sandals or the best military footwear that was possible for the day. Because they had put so much into engineering of those sandals and the way they were worn and how they'd be strapped to the foot and, to the, and up to the, through the, through the part of your, your, your leg here, the importance of that was is for all the structure and the support that it could get, possibly give. It allowed them to make those long marches, which nobody thought they could make, and bring such military force to bear in countries that were far away. The importance of the shoes was, in, was incredible. Uh, I know those of you who served in the military, especially in infantry division or advanced infantry divisions, you realize just how important that boots are. And you can buy one of those shoddy pair of boots and you know how to, your feet are going to be destroyed by having a bad pair of boots in, in, in battle situations or even in training situations. Those long marches will kill you. It's the same way that the Romans understood the importance of footwear and how important it was to get the right footwear on the soldiers, they could do the best they could do within the battlefields that they were going to be in. And the Lord's saying here, you had your feet shod with the best shoes available, by the way. <laughs> the preparation of the gospel of peace. That's kind of a strange verse. In fact, I took this thing and looked at it in the Greek language, how it would literally break down by word by word if we kind of put it in a, instead of, you know, with translators, they try to make it in the most, you know, economical sense for the translation of that verse to arrange a word here or there. And here's the way it would literally read. And having shod yourselves as to the feet, 
in readiness of the gospel of peace. And having shod yourselves, in other words, take the time to get your foot on properly and get the right shoe on to the right thing. Now, as I, as I looked through this and was studying this particular thing, there's about four or five ideas that came out by a lot of theologians. But I think there's an element and a hint of truth to each idea that each particular theologian was presenting as I studied the Word of God here. And, and I came with kind of these four things out of, out of the mix of all these. And I think it, all, all of them are applicable. First of all, I think it means preparedness. It has, in fact, this has to do, this particular word, this readiness and preparation, is a word which was used for some tackling on a ship, on a sailing ship. It would prepare the ship for, for, for sailing or prepare the ship for battle. So there's this idea here of, of readiness, you know, part of your uniform, part of your equipment is, is this readiness to go out at any moment. You're prepared, you're called to action, you're ready to go. It, it, it's, it's done. You can stand, you can fight, you can go do what needs to be done in, in any situation at any time. How often, because we're not ready and because we're not really prepared in our spiritual walk in life, we kind of dawn it as the day goes on somewhere, are we just caught not ready? How many times have we gone through life or perhaps even when those big trials come or some big difficult struggle or situation presents itself in your life and you just, you just felt so unprepared and so unready. But I want you to know if, if your heart and your mind is set on the Lord and you're, you're committing your life daily to Christ, it's amazing how he will show you and prepare you for your situation, sometimes even before you get to the situation. But as soon as you're in it, there's, it comes about... The, the, the availability, I don't know any other way to say it, the, the availability of the Holy Spirit is, is so obvious that he's there and he's present and you're ready that you can deal with this. Paul is talking about in Romans chapter 1, he says, you know, I'm a gospel, I, I'm an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, I am ready to preach the gospel to the Rome. The idea is I'm prepared, I'm ready, come on. If it's today, it's today. If the battle's tomorrow, it's tomorrow. But if it comes next Thursday at 2 o'clock, I'm not going to be sleeping. I'm ready. I, I've, I've been trained. I'm equipped. I have what I need. I can stand. The second element that comes out of this and looking at it, it also signifies a, a prepared foundation or a, a base. It has to do with that, that sure-footedness. In, in, when the battle or the campaign comes and you're engaged in it, there's, you're on solid ground. You can, you can take. You know, you're established. You, you, you're you're in, you're in your proper battle stance. And, and obviously, he says, this is the gospel of peace. Uh, it's interesting that we're talking about a conflict, but we're at peace, all right? There's this gospel of peace, and the gospel is basically the word of God, the redemptive word of God, that Jesus Christ, under the leadership of his heavenly Father, operating out of the love of God has for a lost world, that he came and he gave himself as a sacrifice for our sin, so that we could be made right with God, so we can walk with God, and so he could prepare us in this world that we're living in to stand no matter what comes against us, whether it's principalities or powers or rulers of wickedness in high places, we can stand. It's similar to the illustration that Jesus gave in one of his sermons when he talked about the man who built his house upon the sand and the man who built his house upon the rock. Listen, both men built homes. And both homes were probably more than what was needed. I mean, they had a roof on them. They had walls in them. They had floors on them. Windows, everything you could want. In fact, they could be the best built homes in the neighborhood. But the problem was not with the structure. The problem was with the foundation. He said one man built on sand, another man built on the rock. And the man whose house was built on the sand, when the winds and the trials and the storms came, the house fell flat. It, it didn't stay up. It might have been the most well-built house in the world from a viewpoint, but when you look, there's nothing in which it's resting upon. There's a lot of people who go through a lot of struggle in their life to get everything just properly lined up. I got a house, I got a family, I got a wife, I got children, and have it all just demolished in a day. Things just fall apart. And the world collapses. What happened? Foundation's important. And the foundation which we stand up is the Word of God. And Jesus said, when it comes, and even if the floods come, you're going to be all right. Because you're standing on solid ground. Make sure your life is built upon the principles of God's word. Because Jesus said, he who builds his house upon my word, his house will stand. It's good to know that even in battle, we have something we are standing on. We're not standing in sifting sand or sinking sand. We are built on a solid rock of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have a, a sure foothold. The third way in which this is used in scripture, it means that we have no fear. 
We're at peace. Even in the midst of the storm, even in the midst of the crisis, in the middle of the battle, we are saved, we belong to God, we're protected, we have what we need. Now, I'm not a big New International Version fan because I think the translation gets weak in a lot of different places, but it did translate this in its first edition. It translated this passage of Scripture like this. With your feet fitted with the gospel of peace as a firm footing. With your feet. What are we doing? They're resting in the gospel of peace. We have peace with God. I know what ultimately this really means in my life in so many ways is I don't have to be afraid. I don't have to about fear what's around the corner. I don't have to fear what Satan might throw at me. We talk about demons and spiritual warfare. A lot of people want to run to the behind the pew and hide a little bit. Well, demons are going to kill me. They're going to get me. Listen, we're not afraid of demons. We we have peace with God. We're God's elect. Who can who can bring a charge against us? I believe that neither height nor depth nor prince of powers, powers, Paul said, none of those things can defeat us. We're in Christ. We are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. You should have peace. Don't be afraid. Brother John, I'm facing some difficult situations in my life. Face them, but face them in faith, not fear. Well, there's a struggle going on. I'm having some complications in my marriage. Don't face them with fear. Face them with faith. Well, my children are going through. I'm just not sure. Hey, don't be afraid. You believe God. You hold on to God. You trust God. You stand firm in the gospel of peace. He is the prince of peace, and he is the prince of your heart and your life, so you enjoy the peace that he gives, even when everything around you, like raging hurricanic winds or howling to be afraid or to run, hide. Listen, you don't have to be afraid. In Christ, you stand, and in Christ, you have what you need. Don't let anything move you from that place. The fourth element of this, I believe, and this is where many preachers go with this, it means that we're prepared to share the gospel of peace wherever we go. And that's obviously this truth is just sounding out of this passage. It reminds me of Isaiah when he says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who bring good news, who publish peace, who bring good news of happiness, and who publishes salvation, and who says to Zion, Our God reigns, your God reigns. The picture of this is of a messenger in the Old Testament as Isaiah is giving it. And this messenger is coming into Jerusalem. And anywhere you go to Jerusalem, from anywhere around the world, you always have to go up, all right? Because everything is a lower altitude around it, and you're going up to to Jerusalem. And the idea is they're running across these mountaintops, and as they're running, their feet are thundering across those paths, coming into the city. And it's like a rhythmic tone that they're coming. And as they're running, they're shouting, Our God reigns! Salvation! Deliverance! Victory! Our God reigns! That's the same way we live our lives. How beautiful are the feet of them who bring good news. We are here as God's children and have been left here for this reason. I mean, God, if if, if it's only about getting to heaven, I've told you before, we'd have two preachers here. One to lead you to Christ and one to shoot you. Send you on home to heaven. Be done with it, amen. It's a big struggle. You know, coming to Christ is first, but then we're here for a reason. God wants to use you as an ambassador of reconciliation. He wants to use you as a, as a minister of the peace of God. He wants to use you to sound forth this gospel message. And in doing so, you got some good-looking feet. Now, I can take my shoes and socks off if you want to see what beautiful feet look like. Because God says, I have beautiful feet. He said, well, I, that toenail doesn't look so good. And how long you had those socks on? You know, that, that, that looks a little flat-footed on one side. What do you mean beautiful feet? Hey, if you're the person who has need and someone comes with rescue and deliverance, you're a beautiful thing for that person. And for those who've heard the message and those who, listen, the people who brought the message of, of grace and peace to me, they had the most beautiful feet in the world. Thank God for those feet. So he's talking about a different, higher form of beauty than what we can imagine here, all right? But he's saying, this is what we're about. In fact, if you really want to look at that, sharing with our men's breakfast at the Magnolia campus this last week, there's a verse out of, out of Matthew we talk about often. It says, you know, go and make disciples of all nations. There's that word go is so interesting. And a lot of times when we read that go and make disciples part, we think, okay, I've got to get my gospel tracks and we'll meet at 7 o'clock at church and go out there and we'll, we'll go. That's not what it's talking about. The whole tense of that verb, the whole idea behind that word is, is as we are going, we're making disciples. In other words, whatever... 
the pathway of your life, wherever God is leading it, you're going there and you're making disciples. If it's at school, you're making disciples. If it's on the job, you're making disciples. If it's to the grocery store, you're making disciples. If it's in the home, you're making disciples. If it's at the gas station, you're not just getting gas, you're making disciples. So it's, the idea is as you go. So it's not so much in doing as it is in being. It's in being. This is who I am. I'm a Christian. So why do I talk the way I talk? Talk about Jesus the way I talk about Because that's who I am. I'm in Christ. I'm a new creation. This is part of who I am now. You know, I, 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 you can talk monster trucks. I'd rather talk Jesus. All right? Jesus is a better topic anyway. I know some of you monster truck lovers might not believe that. <laughs> but it's the gospel. The power of God. Listen to what the apostle said. He said, I'm ready to preach the gospel. That means just to speak it. To, to anybody, Jew first, Gentile, to everybody. But catch what he says, because it is the power of God and the salvation to anyone who will believe it. Those are powerful words, aren't they not? It's the power of God to change a person's life. It's the power of God to literally turn somebody around when they trust Jesus Christ. Alone. Their lives are changed forever. Eternally washed, cleansed, bathed in the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Never going to be the same. There'll be struggles, there'll be growth, there'll be maturity that has to take place in your life, but hey, you're in Christ. So have your feet shod with the preparation. Not only are you ready for whatever, not only you realize you have a firm foundation in which you're standing in, you have no fear in the midst of the war that's going on around you. You are an ambassador for Christ, and you are there as a child of God in Christ with God's grace and protection on you. Listen, you want a real practical step from this. They're pretty simple. One is I start my day this way. I realize that Jesus is who I need in my life. If I've not yet given my life to Christ, and the best thing you can do today, ma'am, sir, is to give your heart to Jesus. It's not about joining this church. It's not about being a better person. It's not about doing good works. It's about giving your heart and faith to Christ. You've sinned against God. We're all guilty. And Jesus is the only one that can forgive you. There's no, there's no preacher. There's no pastor. There's no evangelist that can forgive your sins. Only Jesus can forgive your sins. You give your heart to Christ. The Bible calls him your high priest. You come to him. You say, well, Joe, I, I do know the Lord. I've done that in my life. Then what? I start my day way. Lord, I come to you today. And I thank you that I'm, I'm ready for this battle. And I'm taking this armor on and being serious about it. And I'm realizing that you have given me what I need. I had the truth. And I have this breastplate to protect the most important part of my life. And I have, Lord, my feet are ready to go live this day for your glory. That's just, just a simple application of, of trusting and moving that forward in your life that way daily. Now, we'll get to the rest of it, but you don't have to wait till next week's sermon to take up the shield and sword and helmet, okay? I'd encourage you to do that before we get to Sunday. But the beautiful thing is here, folks, think about this. Of all the times we sit back and try to think about our inabilities, our, our excuse our, 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 our fallibilities, it'd be just easier to spend your time with Jesus, get it right with God. And say, Lord, I need you today. There's an old hymn that went, Christ is all I need. Christ is all I need. All I need is Christ. Because that's what it really boils down to. Amen. And then move from your place in that mindset with that attitude. And see how God does move in your life in a very vivid, real way. It'll blow your mind. Amen? Now, I'm going to end my sermon there because I have some announcements I'd like to make this morning. They're, I think, are very important announcements. They're announcements that have come after 10 years of seeking God's face and praying. And I trust you'll give me just a minute of your time uh, to, to deal with these. But first, before I get to those announcements, I have a few closing announcements. And then I'll make what I call my, my main announcement this morning. First of all, gentlemen, if you haven't signed up for the men's retreat, tick-tock, time's running out. In fact, we're just about filling up. And we have 60 spots. This year's men's retreat is going to be one of the most phenomenal men's retreats that we've ever done. And I really believe that with all my heart. We're going to be zeroing in on some glorious things. Uh, we're, we're doing some things really different. When you come to the retreat, and many of you come for many years, you're going to say, this is, we didn't do it this way before. Uh, no, we haven't. But we're really zeroing in on what I think are some of the greatest needs that we have within our men and our men's ministry and our church. I think it'll be a life-transforming retreat for you. So if there's any way possible for you to get there, if you can't come in on Thursday night, then come Friday evening at the latest. All right, come that time. But get signed up today. If you want the early bird discount, obviously we make that available to people that first time out because after this Sunday, they start charging us more and late fees and stuff like that. So we need to get the early bird thing done. All right, so if you're going to come, save yourself about $50, $60, whatever it is. Get signed up today. The registration forms are out in the lobby. Grab one out there anywhere, some on the table, some probably some on the welcome table as well. 
get signed up and register. One of the things we're doing, we're having some ministry teams that are taking place during this retreat time. If you've been asked to be on one of those teams, make sure that when you register, put your name on that form, all right? If someone's asked you about that, you'll know about it if they've asked you. If they have, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll get you a, a team that you'll sign on. Now, this isn't a fishing team, although there's going to be a lot of fishing going on because right, we're on, on the bay. And it's not a golf team. We're having a golf tournament Thursday morning, so don't worry about that. It's not a bingo team or a Yahtzee team, all right? So this is a little more spiritual application for these teams that we're going to be doing. But uh, get signed up for that as well. I cannot encourage you as your pastor, all right, to do this enough. It's just hear my heart. Listen to what I'm saying, guys. Come be a part of this. God will touch your life. It'll make a difference in your life. And it's worth the sacrifice that you may have to make by missing that day of work. Amen. Also, I want to remind you that next Sunday, we'll have people dressed in hazmat suits serving chili right after the service. All right. <laughs> And we're having our chili cook-off. Now, Stephanie, raise your hands up here. She's on the front row. She's overseeing the chili cook-off. So if you haven't turned in your name, we still need some more chili cookers, right? So if you want to cook some chili, uh, registration fee is $25. You get entered into the contest. It's well worth your investment. All the money goes in, by the way, it, it, it's to, to helping our, our women with their, their retreat that's coming up in about a month after the men's retreat. They're trying to provide some scholarships and meet some needs that way. So it all goes to a worthy cause. The actual cost of the chili... When you, if you're just going to go eat chili, is it's just six bucks, all right? And if you have kids, we have hot dogs and a taco bar and some other things. But we need some help. One, if you want to come volunteer and help, be sure and give Stephanie your name because I always need some help getting things set up and prepared and taken down and, and presented. But if you, hey, we need some chili cookers, all right? So cook some chili up. Some, you know, you can make it toxic if you want. Uh, that'll be up to you. And some not so toxic would be appreciated for those folks with older stomachs and younger children, but we do have food for them as well. So it's going to be a fun time. We'll just be, uh, be right after the service. We'll, we'll have dinner or lunch together, and there'll be a time where we'll have some people be selected for, for judging. So uh, if you want to be judged, come on. <laughs> make some good chili, all right? And it'll be appreciated. Now, the next announcements I want to make is, uh, it's like I say, it's one that's been coming for a long, long time. It has to do with our church uh, campuses. We, you know, 10 years ago, we went multi-site. Uh, Ten years ago, that was just a few churches were doing that. Since 2012, I read an article recently that said over 5,000 churches had gone to multi-site churches. Now, they, there's several ways to do multi-site churches that are out there. And the best and most effective way is to have, have it set up where you have campus pastor over each multi-site campus. We've been wrestling with that and how to accomplish that and to do that for quite some time now. About 10 years ago when this happened as a church, we wanted to, not too many were doing it, and we were some of those early ones to step out there. But it has fast become one of the the most popular ways to do church plants in the nation today. And many other churches are joining in, you know, literally a lot more than the 5,000 that started back in 2012 when, when it was happening on a bit much wider scale. But a lot of it has to do with uh, just being able to reach more people, touch more lives, and see more people influenced. I've been carrying on a, a role of, of that's, uh, that is kind of mixing plan came campus pastor at one point campus as well as pastoring that campus and then still trying to come over here and, and be campus pastor here and then other multi roles but we've known for some time and we've been dealing with this with elders for, for, for many years now just talking about when and how we've talked to different people in ministry about joining and, and being a part of that and coming on as a campus pastor and, but uh, then we had other issues that arose with our other campus not knowing what was going to happen with the eminent domain and text dot and all the situation we're going to have with our locations there. So there always seems to be something that would happen that would hinder this from really taking place. And so, but the Lord seems to put all the pieces together at this time. And the elders have been working on this for, for some time now. I've probably been working on it more than anybody because it's been a major issue with me of being, doing my job more effectively and doing what I can to be the pastor that you need me to be and the preaching, teaching pastor that God has called me to be. And so we spent a lot of time on this. I, I poured a lot of countless hours into this process, uh, adding to that what we've done within our elders' meetings off and on over the years, working on this. How are we going to do what God's called us to do effectively in the best way we can do it? So I want to announce to you these, these changes that we're making in leadership in the way we're structuring our leadership this morning. So just be patient with me a little bit while I kind of lay this out to you because it's important you understand the process. It means adding personnel to the church staff, obviously. Now, most times people ask, well, oh, pastor, how are we going to afford that? It's always the bottom line, amen, in anything we do. But let me state this. Believers Fellowship has never paid much attention to the bottom line. We pay more attention in what God wants. And the bottom line always seems to get there. When we first started the church, even then people said, well, 
how are you going to afford that? Uh, there was just a handful of us, you know. And look, here we are today, 30 years later. You know, the first time we even started to say, well, you know, after about six months, I said, you know, you know guys, <clears throat> I hate to bring it up, but we probably ought to pay me. <laughs> From there to adding staff on, to doing all we've done, to buying property, that was a step of faith. We didn't have the money to do that. We just were a little group of people, started putting money aside for a building program. And then we ended up paying for the property, and we used that as collateral for a million dollar loan for a building. So it's always been a step of faith, everything we've done. Here recently, we've had some problems that have hindered this process, but the problems literally have turned out to be blessings. And isn't it interesting, if we pay attention long enough to our problems in our life, if we'll be patient with God, they usually do turn into blessings. You know, obviously it was the, the text dot wanting to take the property over there for the Aggie Expressway, Highway 249 extension. It's going to go, they found where they told us from the beginning, we're going to come in and we're going to take this, but nobody ever saw them do anything about it. And they kept coming in and saying stuff and then they'd stop the process. And so we're kind of back and forth what we're going to do until finally, until this last year, we were able to, you know, finally negotiate the whole thing. That took about a year and a half to finalize the negotiations for the eminent domain where TxDOT takes that property. We've turned one building already over to TxDOT out there, and they're anxiously waiting for us to leave the other building. Right now, we all legally can stay there till the end of April, but we may need to be there in May, possibly. So we're, we're having some, some issues working all that out. But when it finally did happen, and they finally got a check that cashed, and we took the money, uh, we were ready to do some things. And then, on top of that, we had an issue that came up here, a little thing called Hurricane Harvey. Y'all remember that one, right? And by the way, we, we would have already had our annual business meeting by now if it hadn't been for Hurricane Harvey. We're, we were about four or five months off the main server of our church where all the finalizing of all the accounting goes into. So we're slow to get around. It'll be a March business meeting instead of a February business meeting, but it's coming up soon. But even that, you know, estimated close to half a million dollars worth of damages in the building and, and structure and contents and everything else turned into a blessing as well. Now, many of you know that when those blessings came in, the first thing we did was to give. And I think that's always important as your pastor, as long as I live and breathe, one of the first things we'll always do when we're blessed is give. And even when we're not being blessed, we're going to give. Because that's the way you keep the cycle going in your church. Not only do we give to a lot of different ministries and took care of things and a lot of people in our church and other people aren't even in our church giving funds to help them through the hurricane process. We were able to take uh, $60,000, $70,000 down to Belize and help many churches down there in the ministries that they had. That was first step. Second step was to make these staffing changes. We did make one staffing changes by bringing back on my son who served here before he went in the military, back into his communications and directing role and handling all those different areas and areas of IT as well. And part of that was a vision that I shared with you about beginning an online campus so we're reaching more people who aren't going to church at all. And we've shared a little bit of that a few months ago. If you didn't get that, I encourage you to go back and listen to that message. It was, I think it was the second Sunday in January I preached that. But we can talk about that more. But the thing is staffing the church campuses effectively so that we're functioning as a church campus the way God wants, it, wants us to do it. So in the midst of our problems, we've had these blessings that have come out of it. Several weeks ago, I talked to you about many churches in America, and the majority of churches in America are in, are in decline, and they're going down. I don't want to join the ranks of those churches, do you? And so when we're going to make this decision, praise the Lord that the monetary things are there in place that we can do this. But I do think we're not making a decision for today anyway. We're making a decision for two, three years from now where we believe God wants us to be. And that's why we've always had to do it, whether it's hiring children's pastor. We knew where we needed to be and we knew where we weren't. So we made a step in faith to do that. And so that's the, that's the way we feel that God would have us to move. So research has shown us that people who hire campus pastors, and the idea is to have a campus pastor for each location, and the research shows that 80% of all the churches who've gone multi-site have picked their personnel and their pastors within their own ranks, within their own church body. And so as we've sought God's face on this and looked where the Lord would have us to look and successfully and unsuccessfully went some other different routes, we finally come up with what we believe is the Lord's leadership in all this. And please understand, when, as your pastor, I think integrity is one of the most important things that, that, that we can have with one another. And I'm, I'm the first guy who hates to hear somebody say, well, the Lord led me. Because so many times people use that as just to cop out to blanket their will. You know, this is what the Lord's leading, you know, and it's really just saying this is what I've decided. And God hadn't killed me for it yet, so. <laughs> but I honestly say to you, that in the leadership ranks of the elders and pastors of this church, we've really sought the Lord's face on our decision. We are, even with multi-campuses, we are one church. 
You know, we have an executive council of that church under the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are one body. We are one, we have one vision. And even though we have multiple locations, we are committed to that one vision and that one body over all as the Lord has led us. We've chosen to advance in our process of this multi-site campus by selecting campus pastors, one for each campus. That a campus pastor, in case you're not sure, he's not the main preaching pastor. He does teaching and he'll do small group teaching and he'll do teaching in different areas and venues and teaching different ministry leaders. He'll teach on Wednesday nights, all right, and get involved in that, that circular flow of what we do with our pastors on Wednesday nights. And, but each of these campus pastors will be committed to that mostly to a one location venue. Although they're part of the leadership council and that leadership matrix over seeing the whole thing, they're working in tandem with the senior pastor and the elders and godly men that uh, they'll work specifically within the realms of that particular campus and moving forward that campus according to the vision of the church that the Lord has given us to follow, all right? So they'll be leading it in those ways. They'll be training people. They'll be working with recruits and hiring uh, and handling uh, the volunteers and helping develop the ministries within that particular one. They'll, they'll counsel. They'll shepherd. They'll lead. They'll invest in the teams of ministry that are in those church. All right. They'll, they'll, they'll biggest, one of the biggest things they do are all is continue to cast the vision for the church, a believer's fellowship that God has for that campus. And so in doing that and seeking God's face after a lot of hours, a lot of planning, decisions has been made. So let me present these to you. And it may not be your first choice, but once you pray for 10 years like we have, we'll let you give some input. No, <laughs> this has really been a serious issue for us to seek God's face. One is Pastor Strickland, who has served the Lord so graciously and faithfully here at 20, for 20 years at this spring campus, will be relocating to the Magnolia campus. All right, and uh, that has not come by anybody forcing him to make that decision. We presented that to him, and it takes a lot of time of prayer and seeking God's face and seeing that, you know, really feeling the leadership of the Holy Spirit to make that decision. Now, Brother Tim is still a member of Believer's Fellowship. We're not, we're not transporting him to North Dakota or anything like that. All right, he's here. You'll see him at the retreats. You'll see him at the men's you know, not the women's retreat, excuse me, the men's retreat and the couple's retreats, and he'll participate. He'll come back and preach occasionally. He'll be around, all right? You're, you're not losing your best friend, even though he may be your best friend, all right? But this is the, you know, something that, that under the whole auspices of what God was doing, this is where everything is turning, which means we were without a, 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 an actual campus pastor. Tim served in an associate role tremendously and most effectively. This is going to be a challenge for him because it's a whole new world from what he's, in, in, in a lot of ways, from what he's doing. Much of it's similar to what he's been doing already in so many different areas. But it, it's an area that it's going to be a challenge. The next person would be who do we fit for this particular bill for the spring campus. Now, And by the way, when I announced this this morning, uh, I, I didn't tell him that this would all be effective. It would be effective March 1st, all right? But the next choice was, uh, was interesting because uh, uh, this is a guy I've looked at off and on for several years, believing God had his hand on him in ministry and have talked to him about. It's a guy that's from within our own ranks. And I'll just say his name so we quit guessing right quick. It's Gary Juarez. All right, so the shot comes. Now you can clap. <laughs> I've watched Gary's life from the moment he's been saved to following Jesus to becoming servant of the Lord in so many ways and leading small group ministries to deacon ministry, now serving on the elders ministry as well. I've watched this guy's life radically changed. I've watched the testimony of his family, his wife, his children, all those elements that are important. If a man can't lead his own home, he shouldn't be leading the ministry of the church, the Bible says. And uh, this was just, it, it was, the timing just seemed to be obviously the Lord. And I couldn't be more thrilled about it, either one of these situations the way they are, because I know what it's going to do for our church and how it's going to minister to our church. Now, these men are going to make such a tremendous impact in our church. Gary will be leaving the 1st of March also, the public education where he's worked for so long in administrative roles. And this has been a very challenging decision, stepping out of a secular job frame into this whole new world. It's, it'll be challenging for him, for his wife and family. So, you know, our prayers have to be with these guys, you know. And with your pastors, that we ought to be on your daily prayer list, if not at least a couple of times a week. Amen. <laughs> but this is ministry is always a faith journey. All right. And I can't tell you personally how thrilled I am. And hopefully I believe most of you are all excited about it as well. Yes, it, it may be some sorrows and things like that in different aspects of it. But listen, again, we're one church. We're all on the same team. We're all part of the same body. And we're all about this. And we all believe that we are here for such a time as this. And we believe God is raising up this church. I will refuse, as long as I'm past this church, to be settled to some place of mediocrity. And let's just get along and go along. Amen. 
We need to be always planning and advancing and moving and strategizing how we're going to affect the world for the glory of God and how we're going to make a difference for the kingdom of God. And that's all of us. So I encourage you to embrace the vision God's called us to. Folks, we are a unique church, all right? And I believe each church should be unique. But God has given us a unique call to be a church that's built on truth and stands for truth and doesn't go the gimmicky route and doesn't go the market, marketing of the world route. But we, we stay faithful to God and to his word and to the call and realize that it's up to each one of us to fulfill our biblical duties within the body of Christ to see things happen and to see the kingdom grow. So I'm excited what God has for us. And I hope that you are excited as well. And I hope you're believing God with me as we step out and we advance in the days to come. And I cannot tell you how appreciative I am of Tim's sensitivity to this, to make this move, and for Gary's sensitivity to the Holy Spirit as well. And these guys mean the world to me. And uh, I, the beautiful part about this, folks, is you don't have to sit back and say, well, I just hope this is a guy I can trust. A lot of churches have to face that when it comes into staffing changes. You know, the, a group and a committee calls a pastor to come to that church and he comes in there and preaches one Sunday and everybody votes yes or no and it's kind of like internet dating. <laughs> Amen. Well, you've seen these guys' picture. They match, all right? And, uh, what you see is what you get, but what you get is a great blessing. Once you get some guys who are committed to Christ and have a passion and a zeal for Jesus Christ. I'm excited about it. I hope that you are as well. And the way I'd like to close our service, two reminders. One, Roll three. One, we got too much stuff in the food pantry. Uh, we got to find some more people to give food to. But until we do that, you need to come take some of it. All right? There's just a lot of excess back there this week for whatever reason. So they come get, pick up some things and take them home and so they don't go to waste. Two is, if you're a first-time guest today, thank you for being part of our worship service. Uh, normally we'd end with an invitation and it's a normal part of our service. But today we're dealing with some church business. But we're glad you're here and you've endured the church business part of it with us. Thank you for being here. I'm going to be out in the lobby in just a moment. I'd love to meet you personally and thank you for being part of our church. Also got some propaganda I want to put in your hands, all right? But it's good propaganda about a great church that I know about. So come on out there. I'd love to meet you right at the service. Last thing is, folks, even though we've had a surplus financially, that only lasts so long. We need to be faithful in our giving more faithful and as faithful as we've ever been. Amen. We've been called to a high calling. That's the kingdom work. Let's be faithful to the God, to our Father. He's blessed you. You continue to be a blessing to others as well. Can I get an amen? amen. I think the best way we could close our service is to ask the Juarez's, the Stricklands, to come stand here. And if you have a word of encouragement for them, you go by, please just share that. Why don't you come just stand here? And for us to close our service by praying for these guys. So I'm going to come down here and stand in the middle of them and pray for them. And I'm going to ask you just to stand right there with me as we pray this morning. And if you're excited about this, I am say amen. Amen, <laughs> amen and amen. Father, we come to you today. And Lord, we just lift up these men, these women to you, their families. God, I pray for your grace and protection about them. Lord, I know that there's a lot of unseen things and challenges that are before them. But God, I believe you're just going to unfold it to them as you always do when we call on you. And you're going to make it revealed and it's going to be obvious and they'll step out and follow the leadership of your Holy Spirit. We commit these men to you. And we're believing that as we team together, as this church has been called to do, and we stand together with a unified body, Lord, you told us and we stand in unity, the whole world will believe. So we're going to pray in Jesus' name they see Jesus in us and Jesus in our unity. We love you. We dedicate these souls to you. Be glorified in them. Strengthen them. Grace them and anoint them for this call in their life at this stage. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. Y'all come by and greet these guys right quick. Amen. <laughs>